You've heard about the Da Vinci Code. If you want to read a fictionalized account about the early battles over what Christians believe, read that book. If you want to know what the real arguments were about, read Bart Ehrman's book, Lost Christianities. We'll talk to him on North Carolina Book Watch next. Well, welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin and my guest is Bart Ehrman, who is the author of Lost Christianities, The Battle for Scripture and the Faiths We Never Knew. Dr. Ehrman, welcome. Thank you. Well, you're the uh, professor and you're chair of the uh, Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Your new book, Lost Christianities, uh, deals with all of the controversies uh, in the time right after Jesus' life that defined Christianity as we know it today. And um, what were those folks arguing about? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, what, what weren't they arguing about? <laughs> they, uh, yeah, well, the, the book deals with the forms of Christianity in the, mainly in the second and the third centuries and the diversity among various Christian groups. This would groups. be uh, 100 years after uh, Jesus' death or... That's or, right. Uh, right, at, right after Jesus' death, there's a period in which the Christianity is growing and expanding and the books of the New Testament are being written and other books are being written as well. And some of these other books claim to be written by apostles of Jesus, just as the books of the New Testament do. Uh, about a hundred years later, there are disputes about which books actually were written by apostles and which ones weren't, and which beliefs did the apostles really hold and which ones did they not hold. And so there are enor enormous debates about fundamental things in Christianity, including such basic issues as whether there's only one God or some Christians said there were two gods and some Christians said there were 30 gods. There was one Christian group that said there were 365 gods. Uh, all of these groups claimed that they were teaching what Jesus himself taught and that his apostles had written books that, that supported these claims. And it wasn't the case that somebody could simply say, well, look, just read the New Testament and you'll see that these views are wrong because there wasn't a New Testament yet. Uh, the New Testament came about as people disputed what the true beliefs were and disputed which books ought to be included in Scripture. And the New Testament that we have today emerged from, the, from those controversies. Well, you know, in the earlier part of or the introduction to this, I mentioned the Da Vinci Code. And in, in that book, there is supposedly a sort of secret storehouse that has the real secret Gospels. Yes. And there are those, uh, are, are these the Gospels that your book is about? <laughs> uh, in, in a sense, yeah. The, the Da Vinci Code indicates that there were Gospels discovered at uh, a place in Egypt called Nag Hammadi, and that's absolutely true. In 1945, uh, they discovered a group of books, uh, about 52 books altogether, some of them other Gospels. One that uh, allegedly was by Jesus' disciple Philip, another allegedly by his brother, Thomas, uh, and several other Gospels. Uh, and so there are a number of these books. The Da Vinci Code also indicates that there were Gospels discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that's a complete uh, falsehood. That's, that's not true at all. Well, um, in these Gospels that were discovered in Egypt uh, right after the Second World War, were the, I mean, I don't know how to ask this question exactly, but were these um, writings uh, genuine or were they uh, frauds, or with it. What, what status did they have? Well, the books that claimed to be written by Jesus' brother Thomas or by his disciple Philip, they, they almost certainly were not written by these people. So to that extent, they, um, uh, I guess you would call them forgeries. Scholars tend to call use a technical term for them. They call them pseudepigrapha, Pseud uh, <laughs> which uh, doesn't sound as, uh, as negative as forgery. So. It, but it means forgery. It, it means, means forgery. It, it means it, written under a false name. Uh, it, it might be, I, I don't know how to uh, grapple with this really, but it might be that the, that the doctrines in them or the reports might be true, but the claimed authorship is, is uh, well, it's just fraudulent. It's well, just a, yeah, well, that's, that's absolutely right. What, what a document says is true or false independently of who says they're saying mm -hmm. it. And we have, we have the situation actually with writings that made it into the New Testament. There, as an example, there are 13 books out of our 27 books in the New Testament, 13 claimed to be written by Paul. But uh, modern scholars are fairly convinced that Paul didn't write all of them. Uh, the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus, for example, there are very compelling reasons for thinking Paul 
was not actually their author, even though the author claims to be Paul. That doesn't uh, mean that the books themselves are false. Mm -hmm. the, what they say may be true. It's just that Paul wasn't really the so author. So it, it does give a reason to have a separate sort of non-inflammatory word to describe these right. books that may uh, have great guidance and be appropriately in the canon, but just simply aren't uh, written or perhaps are not written by the author that we've always believed. That's right. Written. So people, scholars tend to call these the pseudepigrapha or, or written pseudonymously when... Uh, written under a pseudonym. I see. Under okay. A pseudonym, okay. Right. So, uh, so that uh, rather than calling them forged, which has negative connotations. Like, well, I'm trying to get this to be neutral, but this is very, you know, with a religious person, this gets to be serious stuff. Yes, so, right. but uh, an analogy might be that in the uh, time when we were debating the American Constitution, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison wrote letters in support of it, signing, mm. not always signing their names to it, but yes. signing some other name. Yes. So there was a pseudonym, Yes. but it didn't mean that what they wrote was necessarily uh, not correct or yeah, not, that's not, right. not worthy of merit. This, do, this doesn't apply, by the way, to the Gospels of the New Testament, which we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even though scholars are pretty convinced they weren't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the books themselves don't claim to be written by these people. So they're, they're not pseudonymous. Uh, they're actually anonymous works. These are names that we, as later Christians, have placed on them. That's right. Uh, but for some of us, it's pretty important to associate those Gospels with those names. And a, a, a claim that they're not written by those people yes. becomes uh, a challenge, a, a yes. heretical, I guess. It's well, I think, I think it is a challenge for a lot of people, but uh, w one needs to look at it historically to determine whether uh, we know who wrote these books. And what's clear about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that they were all written by highly educated uh, Greek-speaking Christians probably near the end of the first century, whereas Jesus' own followers were Aramaic-speaking peasants who, according to the New Testament itself, were uneducated. And so it doesn't look as though the, the actual followers of Jesus are the ones who produced Just these Just to press you on that, it's not possible or not likely from a scholarly standpoint that the uh, Gospels could have been delivered by their alleged authors and then uh, in Aramaic and then translated by or, or mm -hmm. compiled by someone uh, yes. who spoke Greek. Well, some, some people have thought that over the years. The problem is that there are, uh, there are indications in the Gospels that they're actually written in Greek, that they're not mm -hmm. Aramaic translations. Mm -hmm. it, it, the argument for, these, for this tends to be fairly technical, and uh, w one needs to be a philologist who knows both Aramaic and Greek. Well, we will Greek. appreciate <laughs> that. Let me, let me, I've, I've gotten a little bit off track from the point in your book, which, is, which uh, I'd like to pursue a little bit, and that is once you've uh, found this treasure trove of lost gospels in Egypt mm. uh, with a whole uh, bunch of new information about what early Christians were thinking, you, you don't toss them away simply because you come to the conclusion that they were written under false names. No, not at all, because uh, the, the, this is a real treasure trove. We, we for, for centuries, have known about other Christian groups that believed a variety of things, not just about God, but also about Jesus, for example. Groups that said that uh, Jesus' death wasn't really what mattered for salvation, but Jesus' teachings are what mattered for salvation. Or even some groups that said Jesus never actually died. Uh, we, we knew about these groups because we had the opponents of these groups write about them in order to attack them. And now for the first time, we actually have their own writings. Uh, and so it's uh, a terrific find and useful for historians to see what different groups were arguing at the, in this early period of Christianity. I want to deal with all of these different arguments, and I'm sure we won't have time to do it. But uh, going back to the Da Vinci Code, there is this notion that some of the early Christians believed in a different way in which women participated in religion and that there was some fundamental uh, different uh, differences from what we believe in the way that Jesus lived his life as far as women were concerned. Yes. And, and are, were, were there, was there a significant group of Christians who really uh, believed in an enhanced role of women in, in the Christian religion? Yeah, I think, I think that that's accurate. There, the, the, group that, uh, the, the group that was behind these documents discovered in Egypt is a group that's commonly uh, known as the Gnostics. They're called Gnostics uh, based on a Greek word for knowledge, which is gnosis. 
Uh, and it appears that in Gnostic Christianity, women had a much higher uh, role in the churches, so that they had positions of authority, and uh, they were uh, the, the uh, feminine in the religion was elevated to a much greater extent than in the kind of Orthodox mm -hmm. Christianity that finally triumphed. Not maybe to the extent that we're led to believe in Da Vinci Code, in the Da Vinci Code. No, I think the Da Vinci Code overplays this, uh, the role of the feminine, and especially the importance of Mary Magdalene, uh, who of course is a central figure in the uh, Da Vinci Code. But, uh, and she, Mary Magdalene was extremely important in early Christianity, and was important in these Gnostic circles especially. Even more important than Mary, uh, mother of Jesus. Yeah, more important than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, Mary Magdalene is understood by some of these texts to be the one to whom Jesus has revealed the secrets of salvation. And the, the male apostles in these texts get a little bit upset because they, well, why did they reveal it to right, her right. and not, not to, to us? And there are these disputes about where, whether Mary Magdalene could actually be the one who, um, who received the truth or not. In this critical dispute that you mentioned as to whether or not salvation was through adherence to the teachings of Jesus versus a sort of a belief in Jesus as I think is the core of most Christian thought yeah. today. How, how did that battle define itself and how, did, how was it resolved? Well, there, one of the most important gospels found in this uh, collection of documents in Nag Hammadi, Egypt is this gospel called uh, the Gospel of Thomas. And it, it's very interesting because it contains 114 sayings of Jesus that are just one after the other. Uh, and that's gotten a lot of, not just in your book, but in other popular books. Oh, huge press, lot, yeah. Uh, Some scholars have wanted to call it the fifth gospel because it's so important and possibly According to some scholars, it's it was written as early as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Wow. I think that that's probably a little extreme. I think it was probably written a little bit later, but but none, nonetheless, it's and a very early gospel. And who was it? Thomas the apostle, or the brother, or just some yeah, other? It's Thomas. Thomas the brother, actually. Uh -huh. His full name is uh, is Didymus Judas Thomas, and the idea is that he was Jesus Jesus' brother who uh, wrote these things. He begins his account. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. again, just following up on what you said, was it written in Greek uh, or was it in some other language and translated? Into we, the, what we found was a document that was actually written in Coptic, which is an ancient Egyptian language, but the original of this was actually uh, composed in Greek. We know this because we have fragments of it that date from a couple centuries mm -hmm. earlier that are in, in Greek. And so the document was originally written in Greek, translated into Coptic, and what we have is the is the Coptic version. And of Coptic it. is the ancient language of that part of Egypt. Of Egypt, it? that's right. Uh, and and we talk about Coptic Christians, so yeah, that's that's right. Okay. It's, it's continued on through All the right. ages. So many opportunities to get off course. What yes. what did, now? What does Thomas teach us? And well, Thomas is interesting because the gospel begins by saying that these are. It begins by saying these are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke, and Didymus Judas Thomas wrote them down. Whoever finds the, tr the uh, meaning of these secret sayings will not taste death. In other words, eternal life comes when you understand the secret teachings of Jesus. And in this gospel, there's nothing about Jesus' death or resurrection. So that as opposed to what became Orthodox Christianity, where salvation, eternal life, comes by believing in Jesus' death and resurrection, according to this gospel, the death and resurrection don't really matter. What matter... What matters is knowing about the secret teachings that Jesus delivers. And then this gospel gives 114 It's a mystery of these kind of religion. Yes. Oh, you have to figure it out. Yes, oh, you, you have, have to, to figure it out. You have to be given the knowledge to understand. And once you have the knowledge to understand, then you, then you acquire salvation. So it's not for everybody. It's not just for the regular people out there. It's only for the insiders who can understand these secret teachings. Well, now we've uh, talked about two sort of uh, aberrant uh, versions of Christianity that might have, under other circumstances, uh, become the majority view. The, 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 that is this uh, idea that we talked about in Thomas that understanding the secret teachings brings salvation. Yes. And the other is that with respect to Mary Madeline that, a, that somehow or another a more uh, appropriate uh, view of the woman's role yes. is, is a key to understanding yes. of, of the plan of salvation. How did how did the, those who became the Orthodox, how did they put down and deal yes. with these 
with these particular, I, I guess in today's language you call them heresies, but back yes. then they were just competitors. Yeah, well the, that's, it's an important point because in probably in the second and third centuries, what, we, what they probably existed was not one big church with some little offshoots that were heresies. Probably what existed were various groups of Christians in different places maintaining different things. And each of them claiming to represent the truth and each saying we have this gospel that comes from did Jesus' it, did brother. It, did it sort itself out geographically more th or, or were there different groups of Christians in yes. big towns with, with different views fighting among each other? Well, yeah, yes and yes. There, <laughs> there were some areas that were predominantly one form of Christianity. And there are other larger urban areas where you had the, in one, one center where you'd have different groups fighting it out. And so one of the groups eventually becomes dominant for a v variety of historical reasons. But the group that we know best about is a group that became dominant in the city of Rome, which of course was the capital of the empire and probably had the largest church in the empire. And eventually the form of Christianity that became dominant in Rome became dominant in other regions around the Roman Empire as Rome asserted its influence. And did that happen because of the adoption by the Roman Emperor of the Christian religion and then the force of the state to impose this? Or yes. There must have been many reasons. But what, there, were, what, there were probably many reasons, but that certainly didn't hurt. When Constantine converted to Christianity in the early fourth century, of course he converted to the form of Christianity in Rome. And once that happened, then these other groups were, uh, for all practical purposes, were, were taken off the map because Roman Christianity then became the dominant form. Although the, it, it may have become dominant even before Constantine for a variety of other historical reasons that this Roman faith became especially prominent in Christianity. What happened to these offshoots? Some of them continued to survive <coughs> for, for centuries. Uh, we have bishops in the fifth century who are say, telling, writing letters to their uh, to their congregation saying things like, well, if you're, if you're going on a travel through such and such a place, make sure you inquire which church you're going into because, in fact, we have these groups of heretics there still. And so uh, we know that there were pockets of resistance for, for centuries afterwards. Now, I'm interested in politics in the Middle East. And you hear in Lebanon about these Marianite Christians. Are they, are, and, and are, there, are, are there any living offshoots of these older religious groups? groups? Well, you know, one time I was giving a uh, lecture here at UNC uh, to a, a continuing education group in the program Humanities, and uh, I was lecturing on Gnosticism. And there was an elderly lady in the back row who continually would uh, raise her hand and correct me whenever I would say <laughs> something. And, and uh, afterwards she came up to me and she said, uh, you may have noticed that I was correcting what you were saying about the Gnostics. And I said, yeah, well, yes, I, I did notice that. And uh, she said, well, it's because I'm a Gnostic. Oh, <laughs> is she a new Gnostic or a traditional? Well, she, 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 she was a new Gnostic. Okay, but, okay. Uh, so there are which meant I just just to clarify and to reemphasize this point about Gnostic, which yes. meant that which meant what? What did she mean that when she, she meant that she was one of these people who had the secret knowledge necessary for salvation that wasn't available to everybody, and that she knew the secrets that uh, that could bring salvation, and she was in a Christian church that was that identified itself as a Gnostic community. And so that the uh, that, that in her church the key to salvation is not belief it is it is it, it, or belief in death in and resurrection death. Of, of Jesus but is a, a belief in these secret secrets, knowledge secret yeah. knowledge and, and gosh I'm getting off track again but what is the what is the secret knowledge well I, it's only for the insiders <laughs> so I would tell you but I'm not really altogether <laughs> sure about you <laughs> <laughs> well if it's, if you could, only, <laughs> what would you what would you what would you do? Well, some of these books actually discovered in Egypt uh, in this find in Nag Hammadi detail what the secret knowledge is, and a lot of it has to do with how we got to be here as human beings. Uh, a lot of these are creation myths, and not only how we came to be, but how the divine realm became came into being, how the the realm of the gods came into being, and how as a result of a catastrophe in the divine realm, this evil material world was created. And so these are myths about how human beings represent trapped spirits from the divine realm and how these trapped spirits can escape this material world to return for salvation. And these were secrets that under the Gnostic, or, or some Gnostic views, uh, Jesus brought to us in his That's time right. on earth. The idea is that uh, since this world itself is evil, we have to escape this world 
and we can only escape this world if somebody brings us knowledge from outside the world that can tell us about how we actually got here and, how, and what, the, what the true world is like. And Jesus is the one who brings this true knowledge that brings salvation. Under that plan, how does it all resolve itself at the end? How, how do we get back or how do we escape yes. this evil? Well, these different Gnostic systems had different ways of explaining how we get back. Some of them indicated that uh, the, the world we live in is layered, so that we, we live here and above us is the sky, but the sky has numerous layers, and there's a different divine being in charge of each of these layers of the, of the skies, of the heavens. And in order to pass through their realm, in order to get back to the real heaven, we have to know the passwords. Uh, and uh, that will allow us to pass through their realm. And so sometimes these systems actually taught you what the passwords were. Well, I, and, and the Gnostic church then just disappeared. It, Over time, eventually, so many people uh, came to disbelieve this way of looking at things, that Gnosticism uh, disappeared, went underground. Uh, there were some Gnostic uh, churches still around up through the Middle Ages. But then when the Gnosticism became uh, an important feature of Christianity again only after the discovery of these documents in Egypt where church, some churches in California, for example, took up this, this stuff and call, now call themselves well, I, Gnostic. Well, I wanted to ask you whether or not these materials uh, have a role to play in modern Christianity other than just a, a, in developing a scholarly understanding of the background of the Christian faith? Well, that's a good question. Uh, why, why would a regular person, Christian or non-Christian, actually even care about this material? I think the reason it's important is because it shows that Christianity has always been very diverse, uh, that it hasn't always been just one thing. It's been a lot of different things. And once one recognizes the wide diversity of early Christianity, I think one can become more tolerant to uh, diversity today. So that rather than insisting that I'm right, you're wrong, uh, this is the right way, that's the wrong way, you realize there are, there's a wide range of opinion about just about everything. Well, on the other hand, I mean, one of the, maybe you could argue that one of the strengths of the Christian faith was that it did develop this sort of uh, rigidness that, so that you knew what it was and that mm. people, uh, more or less, uh, yes. so that it was able to take charge of at least uh, Europe yes. during the Middle Ages and establish its strength. And that this yes. whole diversity of opinion that we had back then and that maybe seems <laughs> we're in the middle of right now is, is a weakening of the of the. Christian experience. Well, one, one could argue that, but it's precisely the exclusivism, the, the idea that we're right and you're wrong, which, by the way, was an invention of Christianity. Before that, religions didn't have this idea. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So, but uh, one could argue that that's precisely what led to the Inquisition, uh, and that that's what led to the suppression of, of, of Jews, and that's what led to the oppression of women, and that's what led to 19th century views of racism, and that it's that exclusivism that led to so many social evils. So you, you would propose that it's um, better for Christians to be tolerant and not so sure that they have found the single one way. Yeah, and, and I as, think as to, to be a better Christian in doing that. I think, I think that it's truer to the history of Christianity to recognize that there's diversity and to be tolerant of others who have other opinions. I mean, uh, we're running short on time, but I, I do want to ask you, and this is a real important question you may not want to answer, but do you find that just in general that, the, that this intense scholarly study and understanding of the early church and the early scriptures is a, a deepens one's faith or that it just attacks it uh -huh. <laughs> all the time? Or is it different with different people? I mean, how does that work? I think it's really different with different people. And, and I've, I find this every semester uh, when I teach uh, my courses in, in New Testament here at, at Chapel Hill. Uh, I teach a very large lecture course. I've got 360 students in the class and they come from a wide range of background. And I get a range of responses to the way I teach the New Testament uh, from a scholarly, historical point of view. Some students decide that they can't believe anymore and they give up their faith. Others get strengthened in their faith and say it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. Others become more open-minded about things. Others decide they don't want to hear it and they stick their head in the sand. And, uh, that, and that. So a very different range of responses. And I think that's true of all scholarship on early religion, that it it affects people differently. What, what about scholars, what about your colleagues? Are, do you find that it's a mixture of some who are, are, have deep spiritual faith and some who are just scholars and don't believe anything? 
<laughs> well, it's one of the most uh, peculiar things about teaching in the Department of Religious Studies that religion is never a topic of discussion. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> that's absolutely right. We never talk about personal religion. It, se it seems odd to an outsider, but that's absolutely the case. That's sort of, is, it's an unspoken rule that you yeah, are it's a real one. Because all of us are studying about religion rather than affirming religion for ourselves. And so it would be quite different if we were a divinity school training ministers. Where, uh, we're it's a state-supported state -supported uh, school, we, and so we respect each other's we beliefs. We study it as an academic topic. That's it. Wow, though, how exciting and uh, what a stimulating, uh, what a large number of things you've given me to think about. Good. And I thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, a wonderful book, Lost Christianities, and we look forward to um, hearing more from you and reading more of your books later on. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Well, our guest on North Carolina Book Watch has been Bart Ehrman, author of Lost Christianities, The Battles for Scripture and the Faiths, the Faiths We Never Knew. Thanks for watching. I'll be back here next time to introduce you to another one of our state's wonderful writers. See you then.